from Stalin, Dublin, um, Russia's life expectancy to um, the first Tsar of Russia, apparently making trade routes more visible. We take a look at the top ten great things done by history's worst rulers. Number ten, Joseph Stalin doubled Russia's life expectancy. Now, believe it or not, you may think about this. Number one, he was a bad dictator, and he was very bad, obviously. Nobody even liked him back then, so. However, he ruled Russia with a huge iron fist. He was responsible for killing 20 million people in, in the Soviet Union. Life under Stalin might have been British and short, however. But during Stalin's regime, the, uh, the average lifespan lived for about 68 years instead of 32 years, which is pretty good. Before the Communist Revolution, Russia's people lived horrified, peasant lifestyles, and... <clears throat> so Stalin played a major role in getting them out of that. He introduced a series of five-year plans that worked wonders. Under Stalin, employment doubled, industrial output increased by 40%, and the country experienced an annual growth rate of 18%. Free healthcare and education was granted to everybody, and diseases dropped to record lows. That means that communism is sometimes good, even though nobody really likes it. Number 9. Genghis Wan had surprisingly progressive policies. Genghis Wan and his army swept through Asia, ruthlessly murdering, raping, and pillaging in any city whose population refused to kneel. By the end of this regime, he had wiped out nearly one-fifth the world's population and conquered almost a quarter of his land. Life was horrible for his enemies. But for the people living in Genghis Wan's empire, things were actually pretty good. The Mongolian Khans had ensured complete religious freedom for all their people and let Buddhist and Muslim leaders raise to the highest levels of Mongolian government. Genghis Wan had also started one of the first international postal services. His network sent mail from Russia to China, and was so massive that it established 1,400 postal stations in China alone. The countries he conquered flourished economically because of the new opportunities Mongolia afforded them. Since these countries were allowed religious and cultural liberties, their cultures flourished as well. Number 8. The Nazis were trailblazers in animal rights. Believe it or not, the Nazis were actually pretty good at one point. Oops. So. But anyway, the reason they're so good is that because Adolf Hitler was, believe it or not, a vegetarian. As it turns out, Mr. Goebbels shared Hitler's sympathy for animal suffering and introduced humane policies that still affect the way we treat animals today, not killing them. So, I would definitely say the Nazis definitely did pass a number of laws to make animal deaths as painless as possible. They dictated specific ways to prepare lobsters and crabs to reduce their suffering, and set up a whole series of rules on how livestock should be butchered. They were also the first government to ban vivisection, the practice of dissecting live animals for research. Today, that practice is strictly controlled in most countries, but a social change we owe to the Nazis. Unfortunately, the Nazis didn't show the same sympathies for human beings as for animals. Number 7. Pope Alexander VI had saved thousands of Jews. He was... He has been immortalized as the very evil Pope. No wonder, he was one of the worst Popes of all of that I can say. Trust me. So, he was the patriarch of the House of Borgia, the infamous family known for their hendistic orgies, violent cruelty, and the abuse of Alexander VI's powerful power. To Jewish refugees, the Alexander VI was a hero. In 1492, when Jews were expelled from Spain, 9,000 starving and ex exiled people made their way to the Papal Estates. Although others had turned the Jews away and abused them, Alexander VI invited them in and granted them protection and freedom of religion. Other forces tried everything they could to change his mind. Still, Alexander VI kept the Jews safe under his care. There is reason to believe that Alexander VI only did this to make Spam mad. <laughs> Ooh, nice. You made a Spanish mad, you idiot.
Whatever his motives, a lot of people owe their lives to the head of the Borgies. Mm. Pretty nice. Even though you're trying to save Jews, don't try to make span, you idiot. Number six. Aaron Burr was a champion for women and the poor. Today, Aaron Burr is best known as the vice president who killed fallen father Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Well, not literally killing him, as being for vice president. So, the story seems especially bizarre because it's hard to understand how Burr got his position in the first place. As it turns out, Burr was insanely popular before he shot Hamilton. Now, I'm actually being serious here. In fact, so p many people wanted him to be president that he accidentally stole the election from Thomas Jefferson. The people loved Burr because he fought their rights. In those days, only landowners could vote. But Burr helped enfranchise the poor through a loophole. He set up land co-ops where poor people could register as property owners and even vote. He was even a champion of women's rights, too. His daughter, Th Theodosia, was famous for being incredibly well-educated, and Burr was an ardent supporter of a vindication of the rights of women. Number 5. Mao Zedong brought cheap peace to China. Mao Zedong killed more of his own people than any other leader or dictator in history. <clears throat> no wonder, he killed around 45 million people during the Great Bleed Forward. This was just in four years. Other than the starvation and imprisonment though, life under Mao was actually more peaceful than it had been in forever. Before Mao, Chinese history was filled with violence and brutality. Shortly after the dawn of the 20th century, the country fell into its infamous Lord area. Really, as soon as the country started calm down, the Japanese invaded, and that war was followed by another, yet yeah, another civil war. When Mao came to power, the, the war finally stopped, and China has endured full-scale wars ever since. They sent soldiers off to support other countries and to quell rebellious states, but the rise of the People's Republic brought a long-awaited area of peace to China. So, I guess that means that Mao Zedong was actually a good guy after all, even though I do believe he was bad. Still. Number 4. Saddam Hussein guaranteed education and medical care to all. Now, Iraq's worst dictator was actually one of America's greatest enemies since the Gulf War. A powerful, very dangerous man who had committed unbelievable atrocities. Hussein would have done much worse if he could have gotten his hands on the right nukes. Wow. <laughs> Nobody even likes Sudan. Uh, Sudan Hussein. However, he also invested in some major developments that massively improved life in Iraq. Under Saddam, Iraq had developed some of the best universities and hospitals in the Arab world, and every one of them was free. So, that literally also means that he made Iraq less corrupt. Cool. Well, Iraq is now one of the most corrupt countries in the Middle East. So if I was you, I wouldn't take a trip there. But literacy rates skyrocketed under Hussein from 52 to 80 percent in just 10 years. Of course, all the imprisonment and torture left enough of a sour taste in his people's mouths for them to tear down statues and celebrate his death. But many Iraqis reading about his fall in the newspaper couldn't understand what they were reading because of Saddam Hussein. Number 3. Pol Pot is loved by Cambodian farmers. One of Cambodia's worst dictators is actually loved by his fellow people. Sim simple. I mean, who would even care about that? But I believe it all, even though he killed a lot of people in a matter of instance, America was not even friends with him. Not even single but close. He ruled the country until 1979, from 1975, but you definitely get the idea now. But here's the reason why Cambodia loves him. So the reason is that because that um, Cambodia was facing corruption from a man named La No, who was actually a prime minister of Cambodia at the time. When the Khmer Raj overthrew Non La No, the United States took a side and bombarded the Cambodian countryside with bombing raids. Why? Communist, obviously. But he gave a lot of, of land 
to very poor people. Farms that actually had belonged to private landowners were broken up and given to families, giving the poor a lot of control and new opportunities. Hmm. Actually very good. Number two. Women's rights advanced by leaps and bounds under Mamir Ma Gaddafi. One of Libya's worst people ever. He ruled for about 42 years. Yeah, that's actually a long time being a military dictator. No wonder. Before all that, though, with his bombings, protesters, and finally every w law of war. Before all that, he actually had some incredible social policies. Gaddafi was a major proponent of social equality. He brought free, compulsory education for both men and women to Libya, or excuse me, Libya, along with free medical care for all. He even tried to sell free housing for everyone, but he wasn't be able to because of taxes, obviously. Women in particular blossomed under Gaddafi. They gained new opportunities in every industry and several high-powered women made lots of money. Yeah, that's actually kind of good right there. But still, we weren't even allowed to go to Libya because of how violent it was. So, definitely, if I was you, I would make sure that I would go to the correct place before... I would make sure that you look at the travel guides, laws, and stuff like that before you go. Because you might not never know what's going to happen in Libya. No wonder. Number nine, uh, excuse me, number one, Ivan the Terrible opened up trade routes that revitalized Russia. Ivan the Terrible massacred his own people in bouts of paranoia and even killed his own son for absolutely no reason. Ivan believed that everyone was conspiring to get rid of him, and he exacted revenge in horrible ways on the people he feared. Perhaps we're lucky enough, though, that nobody actually got rid of him because Ivan the Terrible did some good things for Russia. Instead of having an absolute monarchy where he gets to rule all over the people, he opened up an early constitutional monarchy, even though he was an autocratic ruler. So he led into the provinces, elect their own officials to office, although no prime ministers. He also opened up trade routes with England and Holland that improved life for lots of people. Peasants could use the routes to move to better lands in Russia. And the economy significantly improved with increased trade with England and Holland. Peter the Great would later use Ivan's trade routes to turn Russia into a super major power. Ivan's developments let Peter bring about reforms that completely changed Russian life. So perhaps the secret behind every great success is the hard work of the terrible. So what do you think, guys? Um, how is this awesome top ten? Let us know in the comment section down below what top 10 we should do next, and see you guys next time.